Uh, okay, this is about writing Python 2 extensions, fairly obviously. Just a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer. These views are mine, not my employer. Um, but I work for a hedge fund. I do realize that my societal net, net worth is now negative. Having said that, I'll try and claw some back in this talk. But I spent several years writing C extensions with them, which basically make trading decisions every day uh, to buy and sell several billion dollars worth of stuff. Okay? So, why would you want to write a C extension? Uh, probably three reasons. One, blinding performance. I'll give you an example of that at the end of the talk. Uh, leaner resource usage. If you have swarms of small objects, Python is really poor at uh, using memory that way. Cs can be very good. Um, another reason is you might want to interface with C, existing C or C++ libraries. So, where are the dragons? Okay. These are the kind of languages we're going to be working in. On the left, we have Python, we know and love, or very cuddly. On the right, we have pure C, so standard C, ANSI C, if you like. There are dragons in C, but they're really tiny dragons. Because they have null terminated bytes, they can't harm you. The real dragons are here. <clears throat> you're going to be writing in C code, but you're going to have to follow the patterns that C Python lay down. So these, if you get this wrong, this can really torch your whole project. So the aim of this talk is to turn this dragon into a nice, cuddly, paint-by-numbers <laughs> dragon. Okay, so... First of all, to just to get uh, on the same page, Python has automatic memory management. We know that. The primary mechanism it does for doing this, it uses for this, is um, reference counting. A little quick primer on reference counting. I'm sure you all know this. Whenever you create a Python object, uh, the reference count is set to one. If it ever hits zero, the object can be thrown away. What does a Python object look like? It's really quite simple here. Here's the C code for it. It has two fields in the struct. The first one is a ref count, and the second is a pointer to the object itself. Okay, so let's just see how reference counting works in the interpreter. If I have a bit of code like this, nice little noddy code. Okay, let's see how conceptually, at least, the interpreter is going to treat the memory. First up, I'm going to say A is foo. What the interpreter does is it creates a symbol A on the stack. Okay, it creates this yellow Python object here where reference count of one. And that has a pointer to the foo string on the right, on the heap. If I now go b equals a, b appears on the stack. And that's pointing at the same Python object, so the reference count increases to 2, and b is equivalent to foo. If I now say a is bar, a few more things happen. The reference from a to foo is removed, and the reference count decreases back to 1. A new object bar is created with a reference count of 1, and A is set to that. Okay. If I finally delete A, firstly, uh, I decrease the reference count of that bar object. CPython spots it's now 0, and it now, it now knows that it can go and get rid of bar, can get rid of the Python object, and then it takes A off the stack. And then I guess you all know this, but at least we're now on the same page. There is a garbage collector in Python. Okay. It's really just there to resolve cyclic references, and it only works with collections, so it's not of interest to us in this talk. Just to say, it's not a unicorn, it's not something magic, okay? It's not going to save your sorry ass if you lose C allocated memory, or if you lose pi object references in your C code. The garbage collector is no use to you there. You're obliged now to follow the rules of how CPython does it, and we'll go through a few of those. So, in summary, this talk, I'm going to give you one coding pattern for your C functions when you're writing C Python code. I'm just going to tell you two things to avoid if you want to have safe C extensions. And the three kinds of pi object uh, references that you have in C Python. So when you look at your C Python code in C, any pi object pointer there, you should be able to identify which of these three kinds of pointer it is. Okay? Firstly, two things to avoid. Quite simply, memory leaks and access after free. So let's have a, just a reminder about what memory leaks are in C. And I, so I'm sure you don't write, I, ho I hope you don't write code like this. This is a memory leak in C. I've just malloced a block of 1K memory for a pointer. Pointer goes out of scope. I've lost that memory. It's lurking in my process. I can never reclaim it. Okay. Access after free is a little bit more subtle. Okay. Here's a C access after free. I uh, create a block of memory. I set the eighth 
character to A, and I free the memory and I try and print out the eighth character. Okay, so officially what happens here is it's kind of undefined because that pointer is pointing to a blo block of memory that's now on the free list. Now, it might just work because the content might not have been zapped. But whenever you hear the un word undefined, you should be really scared because it could be anything from a seg fault to the compiler's generated code to send suggested messages to your coworkers <laughs> or has decided to reformat your hard disk. But when you have undefined code here, anything can really happen. But generally, the problem with these bugs is actually nothing happens that will still print out A on a lot of platforms, okay, which gives you the illusion it's all working right. Okay. Well, let's look at the Python analogy of these things. Python memory leaks. So this is C Python code. You can tell because we've hash included python.h up the top. This is a little function that's going to leak something. We've got a pointer, uninitialized pointer to a, an object here. We're going to initialize it by calling the Python function p bytes from string. We give it a string. And C, that function will give us a fully formed uh, Python object back with a reference count of one. Okay. We're now going to just print it out. Okay. And then do nothing because that p object pointer is going to go out of scope and we've lost that memory now that was created by that uh, pi bytes from string. The fix for this is not to go and free the p object. Please don't do that. All you have to do is call decref, which decrements the reference count, and CPython will then go and do the right thing. Okay. So what about access after free? Well, you can do the same thing in Python. If I decref that object, and then I try and print it out, Okay, we're in the same situation that we were before. It's entirely possible that the memory, even though it's back on the free list, has that hello world Python string in it, and it kind of works. Okay? So it gives the illusion it kind of works, but actually this is, again, undefined behavior. So access after free, um, please don't do this, okay, to try and be clever with reference counts. Calling pi decref object and then just saying, oh, okay, if the reference count is above zero, then I'm okay to print it out, you know, because it's not a dead object, okay? The thing is, when you go pi deck ref p object and the reference count goes down to zero, C Python is free to use a memory for anything at all. It's entirely then possible that when you ask what's a ref count, you're asking for some completely garbage value that's in the memory or completely different object itself. So it's entirely possible that memory might be greater than zero, even though it's garbage. So don't try and get cute, please, with checking the values of reference counts in an attempt to sort of get defined behavior. Okay, those are the two things that go wrong. That's all you have to worry about. Okay, the next thing are the three types of references in Python. And these phrases are used throughout the Python C documentation, so I recommend that you try and memorize them. There's new references. We've just seen that when you create a new Python object, like a string. Okay, these appear when... Python objects are created. For example, creating a new list. Stolen references occur when a Py object, Python object is created and it's handed over to a collection, for example, to manage. So typically they're setters. So if I create a string and pass it into a list, okay, uh, the list will st call steal that reference. We'll look at this a bit more closely later. So basically they're generally setters. Borrowed references are using uh, are generally the other way around. They're getters. So when you've got a container with a list of objects, for example, and you want to access one of them, okay, uh, you'll get a, a, what's called a borrowed reference. And I'll explain this in a bit more detail later. Borrowed, I always find a problem with the idea of borrowed, really. But if shared references mean more to you than uh, they do to me, then that's great, because that's just really what they are. So these three... Uh, names are really about the contract that you now have with the Python code, the C Python interpreter. Because it's programming by contract. And here are the contracts. If it's new, this pi, pi object, it's your job to free it, okay, or give it to someone else who will do that. Okay, that's the contract. If it's stolen, whoever's stolen it will free that object. So don't you try and do that as well. If it's a borrowed object, this is a really tricky one. The real owner of that object can free it at any time without telling you, unless you've prevented them by registering your interest in it. And we'll see how that works in practice. Let's take new references first, because they're kind of fairly straightforward. Here's a bit of uh, C Python code. Well, I'm going to take two longs, two C longs, create uh, two Python integers out of them. 
then use uh, subtract the two Python integers and return a result. So I've got three pointers up the top. So PA is pi long from long from A. That just creates a Python uh, integer from a C integer. And that returns a new reference. Okay, So it's a new object. The same with B. And I pass those two pointers into number subtract. That creates another new object. So I've got now three objects in play. Okay, And R is one I'm going to return. But the two intermediate objects, A and B, are my responsibility. Okay, So I have to free them by deck reffing them. I return R. It's a caller's responsibility now to... Uh, free that by deck refing it. So your documentation for this should say subtract long will return a new Python reference to an integer which is the subtraction of one from the other. Okay? So new references, do not do this, please, and get cute and say, oh, I, kinda, I love C one liners, I'm going to just do it all in one line, okay? Because I'm going to create a uh, Python long from A and a Python long from B, pass those into the subtraction. I do get the right answer. I do get a new number back, but I've lost those two longs A and B because the pi number subtract has no idea that it has to free those things. It's not going to do that. Okay. Very interesting, I came across a blog article um, a few days ago by Ned Batchelor, him of coverage fame, and he had a very nice blog article about, in his code, he did exactly this thing by mistake, and there was a, a fairly major memory leak in coverage. Right, let's move on to stolen references. These are like setters. So in this code, I'm going to create a tuple, three long. Okay, so there we go. Pi tuple new, three long. That's a new reference for R, which I'm going to return. V is going to be pi long from long. We've seen this before. That's a new reference. And then I'm going to say pi tuple set item and give it V. Now, at that point, that tuple assumes responsibility for V. Okay, it will free it when that tuple goes out of scope. Okay, not me. Okay, so I shouldn't touch it. I'm going to create the second one in the same manner. I'm just going to reuse V here. The more common pattern with stolen references is the kind of last line here where you create a Unicode string. That's a new reference, and you pass it straight in without taking a pointer yourself, so you can't even touch it. Okay? So this is all fairly good stuff, and again, you're going to return a thing which is the caller's responsibility to free. Stolen reference, do not do this, please. I'm going to pass V in to set, set the item tuple. The tuple takes responsibility with it, but I still got that pointer V. I can muck around with the internals of the tuple. Right? This will cause undefined behavior in many cases. So leave it to the tuple. It's taken care of it. That's a, the that's a contract you have. Okay, borrowed references. These are generally getters. This is a third type of reference. We might have some list that we created here, and I want to get the second item here. So I go pi list get item, the list number two. So the kind of conceptually the situation I have here is I have p list points at this list, which has sort of foobar baz in it, and it's passed me another pointer to baz, okay, which is, and that p val is what's <coughs> called a borrow pointer, shared pointer, if you like. So at this point in time, we now have multiple pointers pointing at the same argument. So who's responsible for freeing it is the question. And what happens to the other pointers when one of them frees it? And this can be the most so source of the most subtle bugs. So borrowed references are ones that you should be really wary of because I'll show you some exciting bugs that can happen <laughs> and weird behavior. Okay. Let's look at a bit of code that does a proper borrowed reference here. So I'm passing in this list. Okay. Um, I want to get uh, the last object. So I say p last equals get item list size minus one. Okay, so I've now got a reference, a borrowed reference to the last object. I can print that out or do whatever I want with it. But before printing it out, I'm going to call some function on the list. Okay, but fine, I've still got this pointer, so I, I can print it out at the end, no problem. But wait a minute, let's just suppose this function here deletes the item, last item in the list. What good is my p last here? In fact, it might well have been deleted. So when I print it out, we're back in undefined behavior. Okay, we might reformat my hard disk. If you're lucky, it'll seg fault. Okay, at that point where you try and print out an object that's been freed, that's if you're lucky. So let's compile this code up and let's call it from the Python interpreter and kind of see what happens really when we pass in stuff. So here's Dragon Zero, right? I've made it into a module called cpyrefs, and I think it's called borrow bad, the function. So I'm going to create a list here, foobar baz, pass it into that, kaboom, segfall. Okay, because I'm trying to print out the last item of the list when it's already been deleted. 
But wait a minute. If I create a list and then I say a equals r minus 1 and I pass it in that list in now, it works just fine. The reason is, by saying a equals r minus 1, I've incremented the ref count of baz so that before it gets deleted, it doesn't quite get deleted by that function call and I still have a, there's enough reference counts in it that my printing actually works. Okay? So this is kind of quite scary because depending on how the caller uses your code, it might seg fault or actually work. Actually, it gets even worse than this. Okay, here's our segfaulting version with foobar baz. Okay, what happens if I just say l equals one, two, three? This actually works fine. It doesn't segfault at all. The reason for this is for efficiency that the numbers minus five to two five five in Python never go out of scope. They're always going to be there. Okay, so the ref count never goes to zero. So in fact, they never get deleted. So I can print out the number three without it being deleted. But if I put in 801, 800, 801, 802, kaboom, off it goes again. So this is really tricky code because if I was following a ticker, a stock market ticker or something like that, the code might run fine because the ticker's always between 0 and 255. Then there's some kind of dot com bubble and it goes up above 255 and kaboom, my software seg falls. <coughs> Let's go back and have a look at the. Oh, so we have runtime errors and data dependent errors. Okay. This is really scary stuff. Okay. So, let's go back and have a look at the problem. Okay, here I have, I'm getting p last, and I'm calling a function, and then I'm going to print out p last, whatever. The fix is really easy, because p last is a borrowed reference. I have to state an interest in this reference, and the way I do that is just by incrementing the reference there, that protects myself, so that function, if it tries to delete the last one, all it does is decrement the ref count, doesn't fully delete it, and then when I've lost interest, once I've printed it out, I decref it, so I'm saying I'm not interested in it anymore, okay? And good programming practice might be to say p last equals null, and just to stop you hundreds of lines below accidentally trying to print it out again. Okay, so those are the three types of references. I was going to give you one pattern for reliable C. The pattern is trying to do this. Borrowed references incremented and decremented correctly. Single place of cleanup code. Raising exceptions consistently. The way in C Python from C you signal an exception is you set an exception and you return null from your function. Or you don't set an exception and you return non null. You have to do it in pairs like that to do it properly. So we're kind of used to writing Pythonic Python, right? So here's some Pythonic Python. Okay, we're going to try and do something, accept any errors, and finally do some cleanup code or whatever. And then we're out, okay? So is it possible we could kind of like take this? and say, could we write Pythonic C? Oops. Okay. Could we write Pythonic C? Well, you know, it's C. It's not Java. We can do anything we want. Of course we, of course we can write Pythonic C. Right. Okay. Here we are. Pythonic C. We're going to go to try. In this try section, we're going to try and do stuff. <laughs> if we have an error, we're going to go to the accept section. If we succeed, we'll go to the finally section. Okay. The accepts section handles any exceptions. The finally section cleans up, and we're out. Huh. I'll quickly go through this. So the function entry, you set your local, any local objects you want to null. We don't want some random stack value in there. Okay. And we're going to go and try. Okay. Remind ourselves we're writing Pythonic C. Okay. In the try, we kind of want to assert that there's no error in place that some previous function has, has done. Then, just going down here, we might create a local object. Okay, if that doesn't work, we're going to set an exception and we're going to jump to accept. Okay, carry on with a try. We're going to create our return value. Okay, if that all works, if that doesn't work, we go to accept. If that does work, we assert that no pi errors occurred up above. We jump to finally. In the exception block, we make sure that the return value is going to be null. Okay, and fall through the finally block. In the finally block here, we decref any local objects we have, we decref any borrowed references from the arguments we've had, and bang, we're out. So all this and more is uh, up on GitHub here. Uh, there's loads of code snippets up there. I just recommend you have a look at that. Uh, there is fabulous documentation in Python. There's a really good tutorial. There's a really good reference. And what I've done on GitHub is try and add a whole load of bits in between that, bridges for how to write Python code, load of code snippets, and reason I'm just about to put up a whole load of debug stuff, how to make debug builds and do that. Quick um, war story, mandatory war story. 
This is one of my open source projects, uh, which is proprietary oil field data binary files that were sequentially written. To read them randomly, you basically create an index, which is create the index as a bunch of seek read operations, which is creates an object about one or two percent of the original file size, and you got random access to these big files. The indexation was originally written in Python. Typically, it took about 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds for every megabyte to generate. How fast can we go? Writing it in C extension took about three days. Here's the performance. Along the bottom, we got the file size in megabytes, log scale. On the top, uh, up the y-axis, we got the cost in milliseconds per megabyte. The red stuff is the original Python code. The green stuff is now the C Python code. It's 100 times faster, roughly. And in fact, some of these outliers down below are reading this file at about 10 gigabytes a second, okay, which is pretty okay. So my summary is one coding pattern to keep the dragons at bay, two things to avoid. Malak, no free, access after free, three kinds of references, new, it's yours, stolen, it's theirs, borrowed, you're sharing something, let them know, and that's it. Um, thank you. <laughs> Can I just say one thing for questions, very, very briefly? Um, this Mac died a couple of days ago which is a bit scary coming to a PyCon to do talks when the Mac's dead, and it's out of warranty as well. Uh, but I did find someone that, uh, at their own expense, put in a brand new logic board, which is very expensive, and turned it around in 48 hours. So I'd just like to thank Apple Store and Basingstoke for doing the right thing. And that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Sponsored by Apple. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that was a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, over there. This is where I trip over bags. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi. Do you have any advice for people um, trying to decide between um, doing extensions in C or using Cython? Um, <coughs> certainly. In fact, if you go to my GitHub thing, there's another thing there about using Cython and some of the little corner cases you can get in trouble with, uh, with Cython. I think Cython is great. I really admire it, and we use it a lot of work. I kind of, my view of Cython is it occupies a really important part of the landscape of, of Python, but I'm never quite sure when I'm on the edge of that landscape in Cython. It is a code generator. It does all sorts of incredibly clever stuff, and sometimes it seems it can have like really pathological effects, so you sort of do a few changes, and suddenly the performance does a real orders of magnitude. Uh, also, the other thing, if you really start writing optimized Cython, then the code is really hard to maintain. It's kind of quite a speciality to write that code, and it looks like nothing else. So it's a great product, but it has, like everything, its limitations. Going straight to C extensions, you kind of know exactly what's going to happen. It's probably a, a thing. But it's a very good choice. Cython's a very good choice in some places. It's a great tool in the box. Another question, Christian. Uh, kind of a similar question to that. Uh, you know, I guess something like CFFI would let you kind of sidestep a lot of the ref counting kind of issues if yep. you had good uh, results with that, or I haven't used that much. I'm right. afraid no. That's yeah. a bit newer, I, mean, I guess. So I, I'd say there are some very interesting libraries out there. There's like one that I came across, which is basically a C++ library that wraps up all of this reference counting kind of together. I think it's called Pi CPP or something like that. Uh, it seems like it hasn't had a lot of love recently, but there's a lot of other approaches that you can take than the one I've given you. That's for sure. Right. Thanks. Any more? Right. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Um, we won't have time for everybody, but uh, we'll go here. Uh, could you recommend any sort of static analysis tooling or other methods of trying to keep ahead of uh, human errors in these memory leak scenarios uh, that you could recommend? Uh, the one I use is, I'm just putting a whole load of debug stuff up on that, that thing that I've been working on. The one I use, Valgrind, is, is, is quite tricky to get working with, with Python. You've got to do a special build of Python, that kind of thing. That's really good at spotting memory leaks. There's some quite good tricks you can do with debug versions of Python. You can ask uh, uh, that create new functions in the sys module that allow you to interrogate the reference counts, and you can kind of surmise that things are going wrong. There's not much tooling. There is a shortage of tooling in this area, and it'd be quite nice to develop some new stuff, yeah. But there is a limited amount, but more work to be done, definitely. Yep. Um, hi, what, what's your views on um, using Swig or Boost Python versus using a C Python API directly? Uh, okay, so we didn't use Boost at work, so it's kind of not particularly an option. If you're using it already, then it's a great alternative. Swig's kind of great if you want to do multi-language to see stuff because you have your common Swig code and you can do that. If you're only doing one language, 
for that. If it works for you, fine. I, personally, I don't use it. But yeah, I know it's out there. It's, a good, it's got some good solutions. OK, final question over here. Um, I don't quite understand the use of these stolen references. Why would a function that you're calling not just increase the reference count if it's going to keep the data? That's a really good question. Um, and the reason, the answer is, uh, if I can just find the um, stolen reference here, which is this one. Yep. OK, so what the question really is, why doesn't get item increment the reference count for you so that you don't have to do that yourself? Well, the reason is it doesn't know. That function, how does it know when plast goes out of scope and when to decrement it? In C++, you could kind of wrap this in some smart pointer, but in C, you can't. So. Okay, okay um, so, Paul, thank you very much. Round of applause, please.